Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to yet another exciting edition of Mindset Learn Extra. My name is Katlejo, and as you guys know, we are on Exam Schools, proudly brought to you by the Department of Basic Education and MTN SA Foundation. I'm not alone in the studio today. We're doing Physical Sciences Paper 2, and I'm with Tracy. Ma'am, how are you? Fine, and you, Katlejo. I'm um, awesome. Please just Good. tell us what aspects of Physical Sciences Paper 2 Exam School what are we doing what today? Today, guys, we're looking at chemistry, and there, I know there's lots, and there's lots, of guy, there's lots of little pieces you're struggling with but we are going to do a rate of reaction question we're going to look at kc calculations i can already hear the groans we're going to look <laughs> at a little bit of electrochemistry and then some fertilizers and hopefully in the last segment we can actually get to ask on ask answer some of your questions that you've been posting on facebook okay so we're going to get through as much as we can but don't worry there's lots of other things in the background that can help you okay so just stay with us all right Awesome. Yeah. Remember, Mindsetters, we are active on social networks. We're on Facebook. It's www.facebook.com forward slash Learn Extra with an X. We are also on Twitter. It's at Learn Extra. Just make sure that you go there for the latest notes on what we're doing today and to just interact with us, post all of those questions that you think are very challenging. And then me and Tracy will attempt to answer them for, uh, for you guys. And you must remember, guys, we know that the nerves are kicking in. It's the final hurdle. And this is grade 12, Paper 2 Physical Sciences. And we're just going to be there for you guys. And of course, we have an exciting uh, competition. K53 Safeway competition that we're running. But then I'm going to tell you, tell you more on this competition a little bit later. But right now, I'm just going to throw it to Tracy to just take Great. it away. Right. Thanks, Kaklikul. Okay, <laughs> guys. So, like I said, we're focusing on questions from paper two, which is your chemistry. Your physics is now done, guys. Whatever happened on Friday, hopefully it went well. It's over. Okay, so now we focus on our chemistry, and that's where we're going to put our energy for now, okay? Because you can't go back, oh, look at that. You can't go back and rewrite, okay? It's done, let's just focus here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a rates of reaction question. And guys, I've really tried to pick out questions that I think you might be struggling with, the little bits and pieces that maybe you don't always focus on or you don't always see, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, okay? So what we have here is the graph below represents the Maxwell-Boltzmann energy distribution graph. Now, remember, that's a temperature graph with how many particles have that kinetic energy. For a reaction mixture at a temperature of 300 degrees. So that 300 degrees may or may not be important, so let's just take it. Area X, which is the area over here, okay, represents the number of molecules in the mixture that have enough kinetic energy for the reaction to take place, which actually means point Y, that point there represents your activation energy, okay? It represents your activation energy, because remember, in order for a reaction to take place, your Particles must have correct orientation, all right, so they must collide in the right way, and they must have sufficient energy. That minimum sufficient energy is your activation energy. And as soon as your particles have more than that minimum su um, sufficient energy, it's above the, kind of the activation energy, the collision's more likely to be effective, okay? So the first question is give the term, oh, look at that. Give a term for the minimum energy needed for a reaction to take place as indicated by Y. Now, uh, hopefully you just saw what I did, grade 12s. The big thing is you reading through your questions and working through the information given to you before you answer the question, okay? So you look through and you look at what the different things are, what does, the, what does different parts of the graph mean, because it's really going to help you. So now I already know that this is the activation energy. Please be careful here. They said give a term, not a symbol. Okay, so you can't write EA, that's not a term, that's a symbol. So that's the activation energy. All right, we're all good with that. Now they say to you, the temperature of the mixture is now increased to, ooh, Look, I put all sorts, no, oh wow, the board is having a moment with me again. It's just to make sure you guys are awake. So let's take that, aw that, that away, there we go. So they ask you, the temperature is now increased to 500 degrees, okay? That means we have a higher temperature, higher temperature means more kinetic energy. Which one of the graph, A or C, represents the distribution graph of the mixture at this higher temperature? Give a reason for your answer. So. We look here and we go, okay, they're saying to you, does graph A or graph C represent the higher temperature? Be careful here, grade 12, because I think a lot of you are going to go, it's got to be A. The graph's higher, okay? But remember, the 
y, sorry, the x axis is representing our kinetic energy. So essentially, the y axis is a measure of temperature. The x axis is number of molecules. So the x axis just tells me how many molecules have that temperature. So when I look at my peak, so over here, that value, which has got the most number of particles have that amount of energy, that is probably more likely the temperature, the temperature you'll feel my system at. So B, which is at 300, you can see slightly higher, which means that C has the greatest kinetic energy. So my answer here is that it's got to be C, because when we look at where it touches the line, Okay, the graph, yes, it's flatter, but my peak on my graph is at a higher temperature, okay? Is at high kinetic energy. So my answer there is C, okay? Now, what you need to recognize here, though, and this is very important, the area under the graphs are equal. Okay, I'm just going to write it in short end. So the area under both graphs are equal. I haven't changed the total number of particles. Okay, that's really, really, really important. Okay, I haven't changed the number of particles. But for C, the peak of the graph is at a higher kinetic energy. That means it's a higher temperature. Okay, for A and C, they both have the same area under the graph, same number of particles, because by heating it up, I haven't created particles, I haven't made particles disappear, I've just changed the kinetic energy, okay? Then it says, use collision theory to explain how this increase in temperature will influence the rate of the reaction. Now, collision theory is the fact that particles need to collide, particles need to collide with sufficient energy and particles need to collide with the correct orientation. So, if we increase the temperature, okay, because that's what we've done, so we state what we did, by increasing the temperature, it means that we increase the number of particles or molecules, okay, with, now watch what I'm saying here, sufficient kinetic energy, okay, so we increase the number of particles with sufficient kinetic energy, all right, which then means for us that we are increasing the number of, now watch another very important word here, number of effective collisions. Now, when I talk about a effective collision grade 12s, what I'm saying here is an effective collision results in the chemical reaction happening. So an effective collision means they come, they bump together, new products are formed, okay? But I haven't finished the question because it says what influence does it have on the rate? All I've done here is I said by increasing the temperature, I increase the number of particles with sufficient kinetic energy. That will then increase the number of effective collisions, which then leads to an increase in the rate of reaction. Please don't forget to actually answer the question, okay? Because it can get quite, you get excited, you write things down and you actually forget, well, the actual point of this was to explain what happens when I increase the temperature. We increase the rate of the reaction, okay? So, a catalyst is added to the mixture. Yay, catalyst, brilliant. Now they ask you, write down the definition of a positive catalyst. They're becoming quite specific about the type of catalysts we're using. A catalyst in general, grade 12s, is defined as a substance which influences the rate of the reaction without undergoing a permanent change, okay? Now, in school, we actually only ever deal with positive catalysts. So we only deal with catalysts that increase the rate of reaction. So if you just tell me that a positive catalyst influences the rate, you're not actually answering the question because a positive catalyst will increase the rate of reaction, all right, but without having, without a permanent change, okay? Now, the reason why we say permanent change is sometimes they can change phase, that sort of stuff, but they don't actually permanent change. They don't actually change um, what they are. They stay. So if I use platinum as a catalyst, it stays platinum. When I use vanadium pentoxide in the contact process, it stays vanadium pentoxide, okay? But now, 
if I have, if a positive catalyst catalyst increases the rate of reaction, and I'm just in case a negative catalyst decreases the rate of reaction. And sometimes in industry we need negative catalysts because reactions are so uncontrollable that we need to actually slow them down. Seems a bit strange with everything we do at school, but at school it's very much a positive catalyst. We want to speed reactions up. Okay? Then, how will the above mentioned action, so the above mentioned action was the catalyst, okay? Catalyst, affect the size of area X, right only down, increase, decrease, remains the same. So, when we go back to our graph, and I say, fine, I add in a catalyst. The catalyst decreases the activation energy, so it increases the rate. That means that might be my activation energy now, okay? So that is possibly my activation energy with the catalyst. So just from a pure mass point of view, you can see that the shaded area now becomes bigger, okay? So when I get to this point, and now it says, well, what... What do we write? We only write increases. Please be careful here as well, grade 12s. Sometimes because you're having to think through your answers, you tend to write all your explanations and stuff, and all they wanted was increases. So it makes it very difficult for your markers. So just be careful there. Now, now we do the explanation, because now it says, well, explain your answer. So now we're now at increases, because a catalyst, all right, decreases activation energy. All right, so if our activation energy decreases, okay, um, the, and, and, and this one becomes a little bit harder to explain. The line that we called Y on the graph, all right, moves to the left. That's this way, all right. Therefore, area X increases. Okay, area X increases. On your Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve, there's only two things they can really ask you about, okay? Number one, what happens when we change the temperature of the system? And number two, what happens with the catalyst? That's pretty much it. So this was quite a nice little question. It, it's not a bad one, it's actually Basically just theory. Remember, chemistry is a lot of theory, okay? And I think you guys are all staying with me. So before we go to a break, we're going to look at an equilibrium question. Now, I know a lot of you really struggle with KC, but <coughs> if you go look on the Facebook page, last night a KC question was posted, okay? And we're so happy that there's, so, there's thousands of you that have looked at it. So well done, it's brilliant, okay? And interacted with the page. Guys, go and look at that question because as, and then try and answer it because if you then click on the comments parts by the question, okay? So it'll be there, don't worry, we'll make sure you can see it, by the comments part. Mindsets have actually gone and given you step-by-step -step instructions on how to work through it. Okay, so we didn't just post it there and say, well, off you go. You know, like when mommy birdies kick baby birdies out the nest, we're like, let's give you some ideas because we know this is one that you struggle with. So those steps are all there. I'm going to do one with you today as well. We know you can do this. So it's about keeping calm, all right? So just go look on the page. It's there. It's one for you to work through. There's lots of other comments, which means you're not alone. You know, there's other people working through it as well, okay? But try the question first before you read through all the comments, okay? Because that's how you learn. But let's look at this one. And this one we got from the Northwest Province Prelim from this year, okay? It says, consider the following chemical equilibrium. So chemical equations. We have NO, nitrogen monoxide gas, plus O2, which then becomes NO2. And of course, this is quite important. They tell me delta H is negative 113. That tells me the forward reaction is exothermic, okay? So the forward reaction is exothermic. Brilliant. Probably a reaction you've seen before. You would have seen it because we use it in the Oswald process for creating nitric acid, okay? Now they say state Le Chatelier's principle. Remember, Le Chatelier's principle says to you that when a system that is in equilibrium experiences a disturbance, the s equilibrium system will 
shift or adjust the equilibrium in such a way as to counteract the disturbance. Okay, there's lots of ways that get stated. Okay, so basically, it's exactly what I said. So when the equilibrium in a this is from the official memo, when the equilibrium in a closed system is disturbed, the system will establish a new equi equilibrium by favoring the reaction that will oppose the disturbance. Learn your definitions. The shuttle is one of those that you pretty much know you're going to get. Okay, now it says, use the Chatelier's principle to explain the effect of an increase in pressure on the amount of NO2 formed. So, we look over here and we go, fine. Whenever we're dealing with pressure, grade 12s, we've got to consider how many molecules we've got. So with this one, we've got 2NO plus O2 on the left, and on the right, I have 2NO2. I do not care about the physical size of these molecules. That is irrelevant, okay? But with, we've got two NO, one oxygen, so I have three particles, three molecules on this side, okay? And on the right-hand side, I only have two molecules. Now, pressure, okay, pressure is defined as the number of collisions, I uh, should maybe write this so that you can read it, number of collisions, per unit area, okay, per unit time. So when we consider the pressure of a gas, we're looking at how, much, how many collisions happen with the walls of the container with each other, okay? Which means if I increase the pressure of the gas, normally it means it's by decreasing the volume, there's more collisions. Now, Pressure, if I increase the pressure on the system, it's going to do the exact opposite of what we did. So we increase the pressure. The opposite to that is to decrease the pressure. That means it's going to favor, okay, the side of the reaction with the least number of molecules. Because then if I have less molecules, I'll have less collisions. Okay? So when they say to you, what happens to an on the amount of NO2. Well, if I'm favoring making NO2 because it's got the least number of particles, that means the NO2 concentration will increase, okay? But now we've got to write that down. So this is what your answer would be, okay? We would increase the NO2. Now this is your reason, okay? So this is your reason. The pressure was increased, okay? Okay, pressure was increased, up arrow means increased. Therefore, okay, your system will shift. So therefore your system shifts, okay, or equilibrium shifts to favor, okay, um, side with least number of molecules. Okay, then we say, fine, we shift to this number of molecules. Therefore, forward reaction favored. In this case. And that means more product, which is more NO2. Okay, nice and simple. All right, it's all about just thinking it through, grade 12s. Now, <coughs> it's time for us to take a short break. When we come back, I am going to tackle your favorite section, the KC calculation. Okay. Yeah, yep. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tracy. Yes, guys, you tuned into Mindset Learn Extras Exam School, proudly sponsored by MTN SA Foundation and, and endorsed by the Department of Basic Education. I'm Katla and of course, as I told you guys, that we are running this awesome competition where you guys stand a chance to win one of the four Chevrolet Spark L. So if you are a bright spark and have purchased yourself this book, remember to just keep your receipt. Go onto our Facebook page. There's a, a www.facebook uh, forward slash uh, learn extra page and then you like or you can go to the Safeway K53 page. It's 
www.facebook.com forward slash Safeway K53. And then you like. After liking, you share. You must remember, guys, to keep your receipt. And of course, the competition closes on the 15th of this month. So you still got time. Go ahead and purchase this book. And you could drive away with the Chevrolet Spark L. I'm going to be posting a question very soon. And of course, I'll tell you guys more and more after this ad break. Stay tuned. Welcome back, guys. You, uh, you are still tuned in to Learn Extra, Mindset Learn Extra, and it's proudly brought to you by MTN Foundation SA and endorsed by the Department of Basic Education. We are on exam school, and as, as I told you guys that we'll be posting a question very soon. Guys, road safety on our roads and on, during school holidays receives a lot of attention, yet 45 people die on our roads each and every day. So I want to post the question to you guys. It's also on our Facebook page. It's www.facebook.com forward slash Learn Extra. The question is there. So if you, are respon you were responsible, responsible for road safety on our roads, what changes or what alternatives would you, you, would, you, would you bring or what would be your number one focus in terms of creating a safer environment where our roads is, are concerned? So remember to go there and then just share your thoughts with us. And I see most of you guys have started posting questions. We are really, really anticipating those questions. Go on and post them. We are here for you guys. And all of those nerves, we are making sure that we are kicking them up out and <laughs> they don't have a chance or they stand a chance in any way where exams are concerned with physical sciences paper too and I'm still in the studio with Tracy. Oh, thank you, Kakleko. Guys, if we don't get to all your Facebook um, problems live on the air, please don't worry about it. Somebody will answer them on the page for you. Don't stress about it. And also, after the show, it's going to be a little bit of a tag team between me and John, but they pre... they old live shows, okay, so that we recorded earlier, which means if you look, if it looks like I've had a quick wardrobe change and a hair change and stuff, it's not just because I'm brilliant, which I am, but um, it's a pre-recorded live show. I'm not sure if that made any sense English-wise, but it doesn't actually matter. You get the point. <laughs> okay, so you can keep asking somebody. We'll be busy on the Facebook page making sure you guys get answers and the help you need, okay, so don't stress about it. Now, let's jump into our equilibrium. All right, so still from the... Um, Northwest Province prelim, and it says an equation below represents an equilibrium reaction in a sealed one decimeter cubed container. Sealed container, great, there's my thing. Now it says to me, at a certain temperature, which is important because remember, Kc is temperature dependent, so if we change the temperature, the Kc value changes with it. The Kc value is 3,93. Now, as soon as I get given the Kc value, it probably means I'm going to have to work backwards. But it's right, we're not going to have a little bit of a moment just yet. The concentration of each reactant and product in the container at equilibrium was, and then they give me a whole bunch of values, so we're going, that's great, we like it with concentrations. Then, one of the conditions affecting the equilibrium is changed. Now remember that means concentration, pressure or temperature, we don't know. And a new equilibrium is established. Okay, so we have a new equilibrium. Brilliant. At the new equilibrium, the NO2 concentration is 0.12 moles per decimeter cubed. Calculate the value at the new equilibrium. Be very, very careful here. You are, because equilibrium is temperature dependent, it's a possibility that they changed the temperature. Maybe they didn't, but I'm not going to know what they did until I work out what the new equilibrium constant is. Okay, so be careful. I can't use that original KC value first. It is a KC question, which means we need a table. Okay, so now remember, we're going to use uh, rice. Some of you might have learned it as an ice table. Okay, it's all nicely set up for me, which is great. Yay, it's very nice. First thing we have to do is write in the values, well, the compounds that we're using, okay? So I'm just going to remind myself. So that's NO2. We added it to nitrogen monoxide, which then gave me dinitrogen oxide and oxygen gas, okay? Now, from here, I've now got to go back to my balanced equation, all right? And that balanced equation was all a one-to-one -one ratio. Let's just double check. One, two nitrogens, two nitrogens, three oxygens, three oxygens. Yes, we like it. It's all a one-to-one -one ratio. What a pleasure, okay? One-to-one -one ratio is so nice to work with because then when I get, when I get a value in my change line, it's actually really nice because they're all going to be the same, 
Okay, so we're not going to worry. Now, I'm pretty sure some of you are going, but Tracy, what's the yellow line for? Well, actually, when I draw this, this is something I do with my own learners, is I make them draw a double line over here, which represents, which shows me that on this side of the left side of the double line, that's my reactants. On the right side of the double line, that's my products, which means my reactants always get smaller. My products always get bigger. Okay, always, always, always. So we always add to the reactants minus from the product. I mean, add to the products minus from the reactants. That double line is just to remind me of that. Okay, it just makes it easier. Now we've got to say, fine, there's a whole bunch of information we've been given. So the first thing is we go, okay, they gave me, let's start here, at the new equilibrium, NO2 concentration is 0.12 moles per decimeter cubed. In what, which one? Let me just double check which one it was. So this is why you've got to read it. It's the NO2, 0.12. So let's go here. NO2 is there, 0.12. But that's concentration. That's in moles per decimeter cube. So we'll come back to the rest in a second. I need initial values. And this one's a little different to what you used to because initially we had it at equilibrium. So we had the system in equilibrium, which means this whole section of information is my initial values, okay? Usually, or sometimes, we start with the reactants and we don't have any product, okay? Because it hasn't reached an equilibrium. For this question, we st started with the whole system in an equilibrium and then made a change. So these are all my initials. But remember, when we do a rice table, we do it with moles, not concentration. So when I look at how much NO2 I have originally, okay, so if I look at the NO2, okay, which is 0.06, the number of moles of NO2 is going to be my concentration times the volume where they made a nice, another nice thing for us, because right here at the beginning, concentration was one, I mean, volume was one. They actually made this so nice for us, because that means I'm going to take my concentration, times it by one, and that gives me my number of moles. How nice were they in this question? Because that means I don't, in all of these values, these concentrations that I've been given, I can just put those into my table as they are because they all just need to be times by one. Okay, so I'm going to go here and my initial here is 0, 0, 6. This is 0, 0, 0,29, 0, 0,18 and 0, 0,38. Okay, so that made it easier. Now we're going to need to make some more adjustments, okay? Now, actually, things are a little different to what I expected, but it's all right. We'll go with it. So if I had a concentration at the end of 0, 0,12, and we know that we're just going to times by 1, that's also going to be 0, 0,12. I'm pretty sure someone here is going, hang on, wait, Tracy, there's a problem, because I can't start with 0, 0, 0,06 moles of... NO2 and end up with 0.12 if I minus. So in fact, whatever I have done to shift my equilibrium has meant that I've increased my reactants and I'm decreasing my products. That is unusual. But it's all right. doesn't change anything about the, what we're doing because to go from 0.06 to 0.12, I add 0.06. Okay, you can do that on your calculators. But because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, yay, all of these are not common or six. And I think they did this deliberately because part of what makes this particular KC value, dif um, KC expression difficult is the fact that we add it to the reactants. Now, that is perfectly okay because we've done something to shift the equilibrium. And the shift we've made has favored making reactants, which we know is completely possible. Okay? So that means there's a whole bunch of things we can look at later as to why that could have happened. So if I started with 0.29, okay, and I've ended, and I'm adding, so over here, all right, so I started with 0.29, okay. The calculator doesn't... Oh, there we go. You see, it's all about taking off these little things. Take it off. Bye, bye. Thank you so much. Not There we go. See, calc it's, and it's also very important to talk to your electronic equipment. Plus, 0.06. Okay. And we get 0.35. 
okay. This is just to double check because you never know sometimes when it's late on a Sunday, your mass goes for a little bit of a loop, okay. Or early on Monday morning when you write your exam. So we get 0, 24. okay. And I'm gonna do the same one over here. Oh, no, I added, oops. Somebody is shouting at the TV right now going, wait, wait, Tracy, you can't do that. And you would be 100% correct because I can't add there, I've got to minus, all right? Because if I've made reactants, I've got to have used up products to make those reactants because I haven't actually, they didn't tell me I added any more stuff in from, um, from the, there was a closed system, okay? So that means this actually becomes 0, 1, 2, and this one becomes 0, 3, 2, okay? But must be in concentration, so I divide by the volume, and that gives me, so this is 0, 35, 0, 1, 2, and 0, 3, 2. All right, so now we're happy, but we're not done yet. We've only done part of the question, because the question actually said to us, what is the KC value? That means setting up the KC expression. Please be careful here, grade 12s. A lot of you have probably been told that to remember how to do KC, it's concentration of products over ch concentration of reactants. And that's true, but that as it stands, like I've written on the board, that is a memory guide, grade 12s, okay? This is not an equation. They will not accept that as your equation, okay? That is a way for you to remember how to set up the equation. And that's sometimes what makes this section difficult because you've got to, you, you can't get it off your information sheet, okay? And remember, my KC value means that I'm going to take KC, I'm going to take my, react, my products, which is N2O and O2, and luckily there's no, they're all to the power of one because they all had a one in front of them, and I'm going to divide it by the concentration of my N2, my NO2 and my O2. Okay, divided by um, NO, sorry. That is my KC equation. Okay, and then I'm going to substitute in what I know. So it's 0, 0,12 times 0, 0,32 divided by 0, 0,12 times 0, 0,35. Okay. There we go. So out comes our wonderful calculators. And remember, we can do this with using ooh, no, 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 fra your fractions. So we've got 0, 0,12 times 0, 0,35. OK, now we do it underneath. 0, 0,12 times 0, ooh, now I'm sure somebody is now looking at this going, Tracy, you've made a mistake, and you are correct. There we go, because over there, that should be 3, 2. Okay, so now we've got it. Okay, get to the end of the equation, because I've done that before, and we say equal, and that gives us 0, 9, 1. Okay, 0, 9, 1. The KC value changed. Automatically, that tells me I changed temperature. Okay, I changed temperature. That's the only thing that can change my KC value. Which then brings me to the next question, because now it asks me which condition concentration temp or temperature was changed. We just know temperature changed. Okay, luckily, okay, which we could have done is they could have actually said to me um, how was the t how was the temperature changed? Okay, and we'll do that in a second. So temperature changed. Your explanation for this is your KC value changed. Okay? Your KC value changed. All right? If your KC value changed, your temperature changed. Okay? Now, it's not, with the memo I got, the official memo, it's not a brilliantly asked question because it says give an explanation for your answer. Well, they didn't ask me how the temperature was changed, okay, um, which would probably be, be a better question because looking at this, all right, so let's have a quick look at this. My KC value was 3,9, 3,93. My KC value became 0, 0,91, okay? So that means by changing the temperature, I favored the reverse reaction, okay, 
favoring the reverse, favoring by favoring the reverse reaction, we now need to look at what this means, okay? Delta H is greater than zero. That tells me that the forward reaction is exo is endothermic, sorry. Okay, forward reaction is endothermic. That means the reverse reaction is exothermic. And to favor the reverse reaction, which is exothermic, I must decrease the temperature. So what we actually did here is we put it, say, in a water bath, uh, cold, in an ice bath, okay? So we actually decreased the temperature to favor the reverse exothermic reaction Therefore, the Kc value got smaller because I increased the amount of reactants. Okay, so they can definitely <coughs> ask you that. So you've got to know that delta H represents the forward reaction. Okay, wow. So, <laughs> done with the Kc value. Guys, take your time with it in your exam. You have the time. <coughs> you don't have to do it in two minutes. If it takes you 15 minutes like it has now, let it take 15 minutes, grade 12s. You have the time. Get it Right. Okay. Time. Definitely time now for a small break. Okay. <laughs> of course, guys. You are watching Exam School, proudly brought to you by Department of Basic Education and endorsed by MTN Foundation SA. And of course, I told you guys we have this exciting competition that we are running. The trick is in the book. Just purchase, like, and share. It's very, very easy. Just go to our Facebook page. It's triple w dot facebook dot com forward slash learn extra with an X. And there are more or less instructions on how you can stand yourself to drive away in that Chevrolet Spark L. We'll be back in a moment and we'll be doing more and more. Just keep posting those questions, guys. I see them on our Facebook page and we'll attempt to them in a moment. Welcome back, guys. You are still tuned into Exam School, proudly sponsored by MTNSA Foundation and endorsed by the Department of Basic Education. I am Katleho. I'm with Tracy here, and we are together, guys, doing Physical Sciences Paper 2 Chemistry. And I see most of you guys have started posting questions. We are going to be attacking or attempting to answer almost all of them in a short while. I must remind you guys that I posted a safe way, uh, safety competition, that uh, or, or more or less question, guys, where more or less we want you guys to just share your thoughts in terms of how you can, you know, uh, more or less issue out or, or contribute in making our roads very, very safer. But then right now I'm just going to throw it to Tracy and uh, to just take it away. Thank you. <laughs> guys, thank you for being with us and, and from my side and from us emptying SA Foundation, thank you. We really appreciate the fact that you're keeping us on air and that yeah. we're able to help so many guys. And also on that note, for those of you that post thank yous and tell us how your exams went, seriously, we really appreciate it. It's nice to know we're making a difference. You know, it's nice to know that what we're doing besides sometimes feeling like I make a complete edit out of myself on national television, um, that we're actually making a difference. It actually does warm our hearts and makes us all worthwhile. So thank you so much. We really do want to hear how your exams went afterwards. We really, really do. Okay, now. Let's tackle electrochemistry and what we have here. And of course, guys, this is one of those sections where um, you're going to get an electrochemical cell, whether it be galvanic or electrolytic, I don't know. But the process is the same. So we are going to look at the prelim paper from KwaZulu Natal. It's actually a really nice one. Now, they're nice. They tell me that I have a galvanic cell, so I know that this is a spontaneous reaction that is set up with an aluminium cell and a platinum half cell under standard conditions. What we need to be aware of here, okay, is we have a gas. So if we look at our diagram, we have a gas. That gas is unable to conduct an electric current. Now, whether this is an electrolytic cell or a galvanic, though we don't often use gas as an electrolytic, but you never know, okay. The thing here is that the electrodes that we put into our cell have to be able to conduct an electric current, okay, because otherwise we can't have the electrons moving and then it defeats the object of having the cell. And the point of a galvanic cell is that we create current, okay. Now your gases like chlorine, um, hydrogen, those are the ones you get most of the time, okay, they can't conduct an electric current. So we've got to find another way to do that and what we do is we add in an inert electrode okay that's the word we use for it an inert electrode what that means is we add in an electrode that's not going to take part in the reaction so this is an electrode that's not going to give or take it's not going to be oxidized it's not going to be reduced it's there so that the electrons that the chlorine either gives or takes 
will have somewhere to go. Okay, so either the electrons will come to that electrode or they'll go away from it, but they will then bond to the chlorine or go away from the chlorine, okay? Which also means, and we're going to look at cell notation, actually we're not going to look at cell notation, but how we would write this in our cell notation is like they've done on this question. Okay, so there, that would be how we'd write it if this is the anode. We haven't decided that yet, but if this is the anode, that's how we would write it, showing that the platinum is actually attached to the chlorine. Okay, it's part of the chlorine part. If the chlorine in this case happens to be the cathode, we haven't done the question, but say it does, okay, then when we write it down, so we have the chlorine, which is, uh, there's our um, uh, iron, which then becomes chlorine gas, all right, with a platinum electrode. So instead of just writing the metal or the solid like we would normally do, we have to write the gas plus whatever electrode we use there. And it's normally some sort of inert metal that's not going to platinum. Platinum's a good one. So if they ask you, use platinum. It's a good one to use. Okay. Hopefully that clears up. We know it's been one of the problems that have been arising and some of the questions we've been getting. Okay, now it says, state the standard conditions that apply to this cell. Standard conditions. Standard condition means the temperature of the cell must be 298 Kelvin, not 273. It's not standard temperature and pressure, okay? Standard temperature. The concentration of the electrolytes okay, must be one mole per decimeter cubed, and the pressure of my gas must be one atmosphere, or 101,3 kilopascals, okay? It's worth three marks, it's worth three conditions. Now be careful, this condition for pressure only applies to a cell that produces a gas or uses a gas. So it only applies to like this hydrogen half cell and something with chlorine, okay? Or any other gas that we might produce. But it doesn't apply, if, if this didn't have a gas in it, then I wouldn't put that as a condition because it doesn't matter then. Okay, now, is the aluminium, the anode or the cathode, give a reason for your answer? Well, this tells me nothing. So that means we go to our redox table, and remember we use table 4B, okay, with lithium at the top, and now we're going to go find, let's have a quick look here, there's my aluminium reaction, okay, aluminium go with aluminium 3 plus, and now we've got one with chlorine, so let's go and find where the chlorine is, and we have a quick look, and we go down, and we look, and we look, and we look, and we go, this is fun, but chlorine, because it's one of the gases is further down. Now we've got to say to ourselves, now be careful with your explanation because I know some of you use 4A, that's fine. The value over here is what tells us whether it's going to be oxidation or reduction, okay? Aluminium is a negative value, okay? That actually means that if we look at this reaction, Aluminium is a very good reducing agent, okay? It's got a negative electron um, potential, okay, electrode potential. Chlorine, because it has a positive potential, is actually a very good oxidizing agent. Very good, good oxidizing agent, okay? That tells me that the chlorine is going to get reduced, the Cl minus... Um, sorry, the chlorine is going, the Cl2 is going to get reduced, okay, it's going to take electrons, become Cl minus, and the aluminium is going to actually be oxidized and it's going to give away its electrons. So the aluminium is actually going to be the important one there, and the chlorine is the important one over there. But now, how do we write that into our pa onto our page? Because now it says, um, is the aluminium the anode or the cathode? Well, the aluminium is your anode. Okay, and your reason for that is it is a stronger reducing agent, okay? It's a stronger reducing agent, therefore Al will be oxidized, okay? 
it's going to be oxidized, okay? It's got a negative electrode, uh, electrode potential. It's going to be a better reducing agent, okay? Then they say, how will the mass of the aluminum electrode change while the cell is in operation? Now, this is a study thing because we know that because the aluminum is being oxidized, the aluminum is given away its electrons, which means it's going from aluminum to aluminum ions. That means it's going to decrease, okay? Because the aluminum metal as an atom is disappearing. Oh, and look, now we've answered our own question because it says write a half reaction to support the answer. Well, we go back here and we just double check. And because it's oxidation, which I know you can't see anything that I've written on the board right now because I've written over myself, is it's going to go in that direction. So Al becomes Al3 plus plus three electrons. Okay, so Al becomes Al3 plus plus three electrons, grade 12s. Very, 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 very important. The arrow, okay? You cannot leave the reaction with the equilibrium arrow, okay? By writing this half reaction, we have made a choice as to which direction this reaction is moving in. And we are saying that the aluminium metal is becoming Al3+. We are not using the reversible reaction. We are writing it as an oxidation half reaction. It must go in one direction and one direction only. If you leave the double arrow here, grade 12s, you will get naught. You get nothing, okay? So be careful. Now it says to me, write down the formula the formula of the oxidizing agent. We decided that aluminium was my reducing agent, okay, because it got oxidized. And then from looking at the table, we've actually said, well, then that means that my Cl2, the chlorine, is the oxidizing agent. So when I write down the formula, not the name, it's Cl2. If you write the name, you will get naught because it says write the formula. Now I know which was my oxidizing agent that will then give me the reduction half reaction, which is this. So we add two electrons to it and it becomes two Cl minus. Okay. Now, because of the way the boards worked, my let my equations, I'll just start looking like I'm swimming, have gone all over the place. So I'm going to have to rewrite some stuff to do this last one because now they want the overall net cell reaction. So we've already said earlier on that aluminium became aluminium 3 plus plus 3 electrons and the chlorine gave away its 2 electrons and became Cl minus. Once again, with the reduction half reaction from here, if you put a double arrow over there, you get naught, okay? So be careful. So why do they want the overall net reaction? Because you're going, well, really? Is it that difficult? Because with your redox, just like with acids and bases, if the aluminium gives away three electrons and the chlorine only takes two, it means I have a, a spare electron just running around doing nothing. Okay, and electrons can't exist like that. That means I've got to balance out the number of electrons. So I'm going to go take the aluminium times by two because I'm finding the lowest common multiple. That changes that to six. I'm going to take the chlorine reaction times by three. Takes those to six. Takes that to six. Okay, we're all happy with that. The number of electrons cancels out like as if it was a maths um, Simultaneous equation, so we get 2Al plus 3Cl2, then gives me 2Al3 plus plus 6Cl minus. Okay, actually not so bad. All right, it looks a little strange, but that's fine. All they actually wanted was this final equation, so make sure your examiner can find that final equation, okay? That's really, really important, and it's all about balancing it. So galvanic cells, really not so bad. Just as an added one, let's just do this because I think you guys are struggling. If I now asked you to write the cell notation, just remind you, okay? Cell notation is always written anode to cathode, okay? So for my cell notation, my anode was the aluminium, 
Okay, we decided that because that was what got oxidized. So that means the aluminium solid became aluminium ions, okay, which is aqueous. And we really should write in the conditions. So it's moles per decimeter cubed, okay. And I'm going to run out of space. Then it gets separated by a salt bridge, okay. And from there, we now write what happens at the cathode, which is the reduction half reaction. And here, my chlorine becomes, so my chlorine gas, okay, which has to <coughs> have the platinum attached to it, becomes, uh, no, yes, that's the right way around, becomes Cl minus, uh, not two, let's just put that here, let's do here. So it becomes, actually, should I write it so I can write it on one page? Just because then you can all see it. Okay, so it becomes, so we've got Cl2, which is a gas and needs platinum attached to it. Okay, in fact, no, the platinum's got to come first. Yes, I'm doing well here, hey. I'm just getting lots of confidence. Let's just go with it. So the platinum, which is a solid, is attached to the Cl2, which is a gas, which of course is at one atmosphere. Okay, becomes, Cl minus, ooh, minus, just make that a minus, aqueous at one mole per decimeter cubed. Okay, so nothing overly difficult here. Okay, we write in exactly what happens, and in fact, if we're very clever, we can write our redox reactions from the cell notation. Always anode to cathode. Okay, so guys, we're going to take a short break. Okay, then we're going to come back and do a short little fertilizer question, and then we will tackle some of the questions you've been, fa you've been posted on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of course, guys, we're just going to take a quick ad break. When we come back, we'll be more or less attempted to attack or tackle most of those questions that you guys have posted on our Facebook page. Just make sure, guys, that we keep the convers conversation going. We are on Twitter. It's at Learn Extra with an X. And on Facebook, of course, it's www.facebook.com forward slash Learn Extra with an X. We're going to be back in a moment. And me and Tracy are still with you guys on this academic journey. Welcome back, guys. You are still tuned in to Mindset Learn Extras Exam School. Proudly uh, brought to you or sponsored by the by, uh, MTN Foundation, MTN SA Foundation, and endorsed by the Department of Basic Education. I am still with Tracy in the studio, and we are doing Physical Sciences Paper 2. Yes. Okay, guys. So, the last of the questions I've prepared for you, and then we will tackle the ones you've sent through, and some of them are brilliant. Such <laughs> nice questions. Yeah. Nothing like putting me on the spot. But if I can't answer them, then I shouldn't be doing this. Anyway, so I love these questions because these are the fertilizers ones. And this question is from the Limpopo prelim. Okay, so you just know that all of you had some doozy questions in your prelims. The flow diagram below represents the processes used to manufacture fertilizer D. So we go and we find, let's go find where fertilizer D is. Well, fertilizer D is over here. Okay, let's do another color. Both the harbor and the contact processes are part of the total process. Each process uses air for one of the starting materials. Okay, so let's have a look at this and we go, if we look over here, they're telling me that I've got air plus oxygen, okay, air which gives me oxygen, and when I take that, that air, from here I get oxygen for this one, and then I take that air and I get nitrogen. And with the nitrogen, I add hydrogen to it. It's known as the Haber process. The Haber process creates ammonia. Okay, so B is probably ammonia. Okay, for the next one, it's part of my sol it's part of my contact process. But to oxygen to get sulfur dioxide, I have to add sulfur. So A is probably sulfur. Sulfur then goes through the sulfur dioxide, which then gives me the contact process. And in the contact process, remember C becomes a little bit more compa complicated here because to C I add water, which gives me sulfuric acid, which probably means C is H2S2O7. It's actually my pyro, it's my uh, oleum and one pyrosulfuric acid. It's not gonna be SO3. So there's a process missing in here where I add oxygen to my sulfur dioxide to give me SO3, which then eventually gets me H2SO4, which then tells me if I'm going to take sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4, 
add it to ammonia, which is B, that's going to give me my fertilizer, which is ammonium sulfate. Okay, guys, in terms of this section, this is about learning. All right, there is absolutely no way around this one. Okay, so now it says to you, name the process used, name the process used to obtain nitrogen industrially. That's the fractional distillation of air. Okay, so that's fractional distillation. So we take air and we freeze it. Well, we liquefy it under very high pressures, very, very low temperatures, and we slowly heat it up, okay? Write down the chemical name of all formula of the compound represented by the letter A, B, B, A, and D. Guys, look what we've done. Can you see that we did it in the question? So before I even looked at the question, I've done it on the flow diagram. Okay, that helps me be a little calmer, in the exam, helps me not stress because I've got it. So when we look at this, we go fine. Um, B, we said was ammonia. All right, so that's NH3, that's its formula. Its name is ammonia. A, we said was sulfur. Okay, we did that, so that's S or sulfur. And then if you're not sure how to do the formula, it's ammonium sulfate, which I know we were struggling to see, so it's ammonium. Sulfate, okay, which if I write the formula nice for you, so you can see it, it's NH4, two of them, SO4, okay. Write down the name or formula, or for, we like it when they do this, of the catalyst used in the contact process. Once again, this is straight learn, that's vanadium pentoxide, okay, which is V2O5, Vanadium pentoxide. That's brilliant. And then they say, oh, guys, do yourself a favor. They, there's definitely a trend at the moment towards knowing the primary nutrients that plants need, which is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and what they used for. Okay, so what they, what the, what their function is in plants. Okay. I don't like that section because it feels like life signs, but that's just me, so just learn them, okay? Write down the name of the primary nutrient in compound D. Now, we've said compound D is ammonium sulfate. The only primary nutrient in there is nitrogen. And guys, here you write down the name. Write down the name, okay? Then, write down the balanced chemical equation for the reaction which leads to the formation of substance C. So when we go back and we look here and we go, all right, substance C we said was the oleum, the H2S207. So that means I've got to add it to the SO3. Okay, this is unusual because they've asked the third step in the contact process, not the second, which is normally what we ask. Okay, which actually makes this a nice question because it's something different. So, that means I'm taking SO3, okay, which should be a 2. I'm adding it to sulfuric acid. And I've just realized what they did here. Adding it to sulfuric acid. That's becoming... And I don't, th that shouldn't be a two, just ignore me over here. Um, yeah, let's take that off. That becomes H2S2O7. Okay, it's an un very unusual question. Then they say, give one reason why there is a continuous demand for fertilizers worldwide. Well, guys, there's lots of reasons. Basically, what it comes down to is food needs to be grown for our ever growing population and in order for us to grow our food quickly and efficiently we need fertilizers it is only one mark but all these questions have to be cause and effect okay so fertilizers are used to grow crops in order to feed a growing worldwide population Okay, so cause and effect. You can't just say because there's a growing worldwide population. That doesn't explain to me why I need fertilizers. I need fertilizers to grow the food to feed them. Okay, 
Hopefully you got that. With this question, I know I went quickly, guys, but the fertilizer industry is a guaranteed question. Okay, you are going to get one of the industrial processes. You need to know it well. Okay, that means we can now start tackling some of your questions. So, here we go. So, Angel, you asked, how do you calculate the concentration if you are given the pH? Well, if we look at the fact that pH, all right, from your pH is, pH is the negative log of the, the H3O plus concentration, okay? That means when we look at how to find my concentration, I need to do the reverse of this reaction. So if I know the pH, I can find the concentration. So my concentration of H3O plus is equal to 10 to the negative pH. Okay, so whatever value I get in here, I plug it into my calculator. So if you look at your calculators, okay, so we're looking over here, <coughs> and um, you've got the log value over there. You've got your log, that's how you would normally do it. So say I know the pH is 12. So I tell you that the pH of my system is, or not even, let's make it... Uh, yeah, let's make it 12.2, just so it's something different. When I put it into my calculator, I go second function, okay, because that's what I'm looking for, and I'm going negative 12.2, and look there, I get 6,3 times 10 to the minus 13. Okay, now that is actually a fine value because this is the H3O plus concentration, Angel, which means I must get a very small concentration of H3O plus because at 12,2 it's very basic. Okay, so my H3O plus concentration is very, very small. So basically, to find the concentration, if I know the pH, I use the 10 to the negative pH, okay? That's just the formula you're going to need to learn, sweet pea. All right, hopefully that helped. So, let's go back. No, no, that's not. Let's go back this way. Then, can you please help me? This is Kaklejo, I think. How's it pronounced? Let's go with it. Can you please help me with the part whereby we use the Shatley's principle to explain acid and bases reaction with the use of indicators? Well, that's a lot of stuff. I think what you're asking me, sweetie, is what do I do when I've got, so we use ionization constants, okay, for our equilibrium, and then we're looking at whether, which indicators we've got to use. I think that's what you're trying to get at. But now remember, for ionization of water, which is where we get our pH scale from, it's the concentration of my H3O plus with my concentration of my OH minus, okay? For an acid, we also get the, we get the Ka, which is your ionization constant for an acid, and you get the ionization constant for a base, which depending on the acid or base gives you a value. When your ionization constant for an acid is very big, okay, or your concentration is very big, it means that it's a very strong acid. When it's very small, it makes it a very weak acid, okay? In terms of choosing your um, indicator, I've never chosen an indicator based on the ionization constant. I think what you're looking at is your, hyd your hydrolysis reactions. So you're looking at the fact, say, for example, when we mix, um, okay, if we take something like hydrochloric acid, okay, and we mix it with ammonia, Okay, it's an acid-base reaction. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. Ammonia is a weak base. Okay, and what we end up with is we're going to end up with NH4 plus, okay, and Cl minus ions. Okay, now what happens here, and yes, it's an equilibrium. I've done it in one, in one way, though. The HCl becomes a very weak conjugate base. So this is the HCl's conjugate base, which is weak. Okay, and the ammonia becomes quite a strong <laughs> conjugate acid. When we then look at what indicator to look at, we've now got to decide that salt at the end, and of course we get, um, this one doesn't give us water actually. So we've got to look at the NH4 plus, and we go, well, what would happen if I take that NH4 plus 
and it's now dissolving in water. So we get H, so we get H2O. And what happens here is the NH4 plus actually gives away its hydrogen and becomes and creates H3O plus ions because it's a much stronger acid than the Cl minus is a base. Okay. Now because this is a very strong acid, okay, that means when we look at this in terms of equilibrium, we're going to have a very high concentration of H3O plus ions. Okay? If we have a very high concentration of H3O plus ions, that means that when I look at my indicator, I've got to choose an indicator that's going to change color at a very low pH. Okay? So my pH um, my end point is quite low. So probably for something like this, I would use phenylphthalein, okay, which changes at about three or four, I think it is. Okay? That you should know your indicators, and it goes from clear to bright pink. It's so beautiful. Okay, but this one gives me my pH, and that tells me, because of the hydrolysis of the salt, that I get H3O+. Now, as a quick way to remember, because sometimes you can't always work these out, okay? And this is what I just tell my kids. If I have a strong acid with a strong base, you're going to get a neutral salt, okay? Because they sort of cancel each other out, so something like lit litmus is great. If I have a strong acid with a weak base, you get an acidic salt, like we've just done, which means your pH is quite low, so you've got to choose an indicator that changes color quite low. If I have a weak acid, plus a strong base, you get a basic salt. And the salt takes on the characteristic of whatever was strongest in your system, which means a basic salt means you're going to use something like your bromyl thymol blue or your methyl orange or something like that, and it's going to change color at a higher pH. Okay, I am hoping they're not going to be mean and ask you a hydrolysis reaction like this, okay? Now, like I said, I use the NH4 because I know the Cl- is an extremely weak base, okay? It's not going to take a hydrogen back very, very easily. Okay, so guys, I know I haven't got to everyone's questions. Guys, don't worry about it. We just don't want to overload you too much because I do have a couple of things here, all right? We'll <coughs> add, probably add a couple of more, but we're going to take a short break and then we'll tackle some more questions, okay? She said it better, guys. We're going to take a quick ad break. When we come back, we're going to be sure that we attempt to uh, tackle most of your questions. But then, Katleho, Weissman, Tusani, be sure that you guys will be attempting to most of your question that has to do with hydraulic energy or hydraulic acid and uh, also the, the K, K... KW. KW. Here we go. <laughs> so, All guys, right. we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back, Mindset. As you are tuned into Mindset Learn Extras Exam School, proudly sponsored by MTN SA Foundation and endorsed by the Department of Basic Education. Guys, we are tackling some of your Facebook questions with Tracy here. And of course, I told you guys that we have an exciting competition that we are running where, guys, you stand a chance to drive away in that Chevrolet Spark L. It's very, very easy. You just go into any of your retailers, buy this Safeway K53 book, or you can download the, Samsung, uh, the app on your Samsung Galaxy and just make sure that you keep that receipt Go onto our Facebook page, it's www.facebook.com forward slash learn extra, or you can go to the Safeway K53 page and then just like there. After liking, you share it and then you stand a chance. Guys, we'll be, the competition is closing on the 15th and then we'll be making sure that we keep you updated in terms of when uh, we're going to be announcing the winner of that uh, Chevrolet Spark L. But then right now, I'm just going to throw it to Tracy to just take Thank it away. Thank you. Okay, Kakleho, we're coming back to your question because we've had a little bit of a discussion and I think I might actually now know what you're wanting from me, okay? So you are probably referring to the fact that sometimes in our books we do this reaction as an indicator, okay? So H-I-N in represents an indicator, methyl orange, bromyl thymol blue, whatever it is. We add it to water and now let's just say this is phenylphthalein. No, we're not going to say that. We just say it's water, whatever color it is. And then... When we add it to water, it goes to another color, okay? So we get two different colors. Now, with the equilibrium, so say, for example, I add this react this to a acid, okay? So I add my indicator to an acid. By adding it to an acid, I'm increasing the H3O plus concentration. So Le Chastelier says to me that if I increase the H3O plus concentration, I favor the side that will use it up. So let's just say this is... Um, 
this is red let's just make it up this is orange and this is purple okay i don't there's no indicator does that, that does that let's just go with it okay i add this to an acid okay that means i increase the h through a plus concentration that favors the left hand side of my reaction that means my indicator will go orange if i add it to a base okay which means i've got rh minus ions those rh minus ions react with the h3o plus take the h3o plus ions out of the system so that means we have to make more indicator and this particular indicator will go purple okay so that's the the shots that goes with your indicators i do have to correct something that i said i said to you that we use phenylphthalein for an acidic salt we don't i apologize we use it for a basic salt okay phenylphthalein changes color at quite a high ph and your methyl orange and methyl reds turn um, color at a very low pH, so they, they're good for your acidic salts, and bromyl thymol blue is very good for your neutral salts. Okay, I hope that helped. I know I'm going really fast, but we're going to run out of time. Um, and then, Wiseman asks, how do you find the net equation when dealing with an inert electrode in the galvanic cell? Wiseman, if you have an inert electrode, that means you've probably got a gas. Okay, so just like we did when we did the electrolytic cell I did, a uh, galvanic cell I did earlier, okay, the gas involved is what you look for. You ignore the inert electrode in terms of the overall cell reaction, okay? So if you have something like platinum in your cell, you ignore it. It's there to transport the electrons. It doesn't take part. You've got to look at the gas that's being put in there, whether it be hydrogen or chlorine or whatever the other case may be. Mm. So go back and look at that question we did where we had the chlorine okay so if we look here all right and we go back to the chlorine question which was over here the overall cell reaction with the uh, no there it, it's that one the overall cell reaction when i did it mm. okay i have no inert gas in there i mean no inert electrode i ignore it it doesn't actually matter with this part okay so just be careful with that one we can ignore the inert electrodes then matt you asked Oh, sorry, to Sonny, I apologize. Can you please show me how to write the cell notation on a galvanic cell combined with a standard hydrogen potential? To Sonny, it depends on whether we now have a anode, hydrogen as an anode or hydrogen as a cathode, okay? So if we look at our cell, remember your hydrogen anode is over here, your hydrogen cell, sorry, I apologize, it's zero. Okay, which I'm um, uh, no, where's it gone? Here's my hydrogen half cell. Okay, and if say let's put it with the uh, aluminium. Okay, that would give me a spontaneous reaction. Okay, that's how I'd find it. So what I would do there is I know that the aluminium is going to be my um, anode. So the aluminium. So this looks exactly like we did last time. I'm going to do it very briefly. Okay. Ooh. Uh, now I'm turning aluminium into copper. That's actually quite impressive. Um, just saying, because the aluminium, which is a solid, is becoming aluminium as an iron. Okay, so we're not worried about that side of the reaction. It goes to there. And just like with the chlorine, the hydrogen now is going to give away its electrons. So here we have platinum, which is my um, inert electrode. Be goes to hydrogen gas. And then we have the H plus ions okay if we now work with it where my hydrogen sorry is your anode so let's mix the hydrogen say with copper okay all right so now if this is a spontaneous reaction okay the the hydrogen is my anode so it's going to go from hydrogen gas all right so over here that means i put my platinum okay which is my solid we have hydrogen gas which is becoming H plus, and on the other side, I have, so the hydrogen is given away its electrons. This is, prop, this would be a difficult one, but the copper two plus becomes copper metal. So you write it exactly the same way as you do any of your other cells. Make sure you've got your inert, um, your inert electrode in there, and your A for away. Okay, then, Matt. Why is Cl2 in the Cl2 cell 
an anode because on the data sheet, it's a weaker reducing agent. Matt, this is a difficult question without actually seeing what you asked, without actually seeing your, your question. But if you look at your redox table, so now you're concerned, okay, about why you've got the CL being, what did you say? The CL is being, is the anode, it's been oxidized, okay? So when we look here, the CU, you got your CL and then you've got your, um, here. Matt, your CL can be the anode, okay, if you are looking at an electrolytic cell. So in other words, instead of letting it be a spontaneous reaction, which is where I think you're getting confused, you're looking at a cell which has a power supply. That's the only way your chlorine can now be your anode, so it can be oxidized. So we're forcing the inverse. We're forcing the non-spontaneous reaction. So you need to look carefully. Every one of these can act contrary to what I told you earlier with a galvanic cell. Remember, a galvanic cell is spontaneous. So when I say to you that the chlorine in that cell that I did earlier is your oxidizing agent, that was because it was a galvanic cell, it was spontaneous, okay? But if I had put a power supply into that circuit, then instead of creating elect uh, electrical energy, I'm creating um, I'm now using electrical <coughs> energy to create chemical energy, all right, that would then reverse the process and that makes the chlorine your reducing agent, okay? That makes, makes the chlorine your anode. So you've got to look at the setup. So if you go back and you look over here, when I looked at this cell, I knew, first of all, they told me it was galvanic, okay? First of all, and they put a ammeter or galvanometer into the circuit. If over there they had put a power supply, then it's the opposite way around. So your oxidizing agent, your reducing agent are now the opposite in an electrolytic cell. Okay, so I really hope that helps you, Matt. All right, and ooh, Nkazi, can you help me with the oxidation numbers? I don't know how to calculate them. Nikazi, the easiest way to look at your oxidation numbers is they're pretty much equal to your valency numbers, okay? You spent a lot of time over that in grade 11, all right? And you needed it to do redox. Don't stress too much about oxidation numbers now because actually you can get all your redox values off your redox table, okay? So don't stress about it, but your oxidation numbers in essence, are equal to your valency, so you get that off your periodic table. You're probably going to have to go and look back at that a little bit. Okay, um, I'm not. I'm not going to have enough time to actually do this equation. This was out of your prelim, though. Okay, um, I'm definitely not going to be able to. I've run out of time, guys, to do these, which is a little. Sad. Don't stress, guys. I'm sorry I can't do yes. them live with you, but there will be somebody looking at the Facebook page, helping you with your calculations. Grade 12s, make sure you get a good night's sleep tonight. Okay, make sure you've done your last minute stuff. Don't stay up till 3 o'clock tomorrow morning because then you're going to forget everything you know. All right, you've done your best. There's nothing more you can do, okay? So study hard, make sure you know your definitions, make sure you know your laws. Those are things you need to focus on. Those are things that get you easy marks. And just take your time tomorrow, okay? Be calm, you've done your best. Guys, I wish you all the best for this exam. I know you've done great. I'm looking forward to some great results. And well, this is actually my last show for the year. So I'll see next year's grade 12s or 11s, whatever it is, in the new year. So guys, have a good holiday as well, okay? You enjoy your rest. Thank you very much, Tracy. It has been an absolute pleasure working with you. Thank of you. course, guys, it's our last show of, of mine and Tracy's last show. And but remember, guys, we are always here for you. Just keep it, uh, you know, keep it going on Facebook. And of course, most of you guys have seen, you've posted questions about the KC uh, questions. We are going to be attempting to them in, uh, on our Facebook page. Remember, it's www.facebook.com forward slash learn extra with an X. We'll be sure that we attempt to most of those questions. And remember, guys, our competition is going, it's closing on the 15th. Just make sure that you purchase, purchase this book. And to all of you grade 12, just relax. All the best uh, for your exam tomorrow.